All right, good morning, everyone. So we're going to continue our discussion of these pre-trained networks and then finish up the unit. So the idea was that the, uh, these, these state-of-the-art networks are really giant, and we can't train them from scratch uh, ourselves. So we can, however, um, use most of the weights in the early layers and just train the layers towards the end for a new task if we want to do that. Um, so that's the idea behind transfer learning. And then the other thing we've been talking about is a number of the networks that are available to us in PyTorch as a way of understanding how networks evolved over the years. And um, yeah, basically just like the evolution of these deep networks. So we started with um, AlexNet. And that was our, the first network we considered. And then VGG, um, the main thing, or one of the main things relative to AlexNet was use um, many small kernels like 3x3 three three instead of bigger kernels like 11x11. 11 11. And by using smaller kernels, you can afford to have many more layers. And that depth helps you more than the larger kernels help. So with VGG, basically halved the error rate of AlexNet. Um, and yeah, so that, that was sort of uh, one thing that was learned. Then it was noticed that the number of parameters was um, getting kind of out of control. The networks were getting deeper. The number of parameters was growing too large. So then researchers started working on more efficient ways of designing networks that were deep yet had fewer parameters. And so here we have um, Google Net or Inception, um, Inception version one that had only 5 million parameters, which is, as you can see, a huge reduction over the uh, VGG 16. And yet it performed even slightly better. And the idea here was to have um, these inception modules, which have different size convolutions in parallel. And with the larger convolutions, like 5x5, five five, you use fewer channels than with the smaller convolutions, like 1x1. One one. And in this way, you can be um, more efficient. And there were some other tricks, too, but that was one of the main ideas. OK, so that brings us to residual networks. So over the years, the networks are getting deeper and deeper. Performance is getting better. Um, but then people started realizing that these networks were getting too deep. And so there's a couple different issues here with depth. So one issue with depth is vanishing gradients. So this is something we talked about previously, where when you propagate gradients back, um, they can get smaller and smaller as you get to the beginning of the network. And this was largely solved by things like ReLU activation instead of sigmoid and batch norm. But then as the networks kept getting deeper, there was sort of a new problem it's called the degradation problem. And so what the researchers noticed is that even the training error was increasing as the networks got deeper. So it wasn't like a overfitting, underfitting sort of thing. It wasn't vanishing gradients. It was something different. Training error was increasing. And so one way to think about it is if you have a network architecture where you can cascade a new layer, that's the identity layer, meaning a layer that does nothing, then that layer is not going to make your performance get worse, right, if I can keep putting on identities. So that, that kind of suggests that the fact that performance was getting worse as they're adding more layers shows that these layers were not able to act like identities. So they put on more and more layers, and the layers were somehow harming the performance rather than helping. So the idea was, let's make layers that can act like identities, basically. And then if we have layers that can act like identities, when I put a new layer on, 
if the network wants to learn to be an identity, it won't hurt the network at all, right? So you can make it as deep as you want, and the network will adjust by saying it's deep enough. Uh, I'm just going to sort of turn these last layers um, to be trivial. So that's kind of one way to think about it. Um, it. So what they notice is that when you think about like a standard convolution in ReLU, it's difficult to make that act like an identity because of the ReLU. ReLU just clips half of the negatives, right? So, so as a way to, um, to get around this problem, they invented these things called residual blocks. And residual block looks like this on the right. So here we have like standard convolution, ReLU, convolution. And then what's new is this, what they call the skip connection. And the skip connection just bypasses all this stuff. And so for example, it's really easy to make this act like an identity by setting these weights to zero. Because when these weights are zero, then the data just flows around and you can see this whole layer looks like an identity. And if you want this to not be an identity, you just turn on these weights. Okay, so this, this is a, a residual block. And there's a few other things they had to figure out. Like, for example, what if, what if there's some pooling here or subsampling and so that the output is a different uh, dimension than the input? Well, in that case, you need to do something like put in a layer here that just changes the size, changes the dimension, like a dense layer. So there's various things that you can do with regard to that. But basically, this is sort of the main idea is these skip connections. And these things are called resonance, residual networks. And um, <clears throat> so these were introduced at the end of 2005. They solved that degradation problem. And they allow super deep networks, for example, hundreds of layers. I think they have some that are, yeah, hundreds of layers deep. And uh, consequently, they won the 2015 competition with 3.6 error rate. So this is having the previous year. So this is a major, major advance. And the complexity wasn't um, small you know, is under control, but it was uh, slightly lower than BGG-16. So if you remember, that was, I think, 180 million parameters. So the point was that they, they solved this depth problem with residual, residual layers. So any questions so far? OK, so there's another nice way to think about what's really going on with these residual networks. So here's an example, sort of a stylized example of a three-layer residual network. So here you can see you have these skip connections around every layer. If you think about it, there's eight different ways the data can flow through this. And I say eight because when you have L layers, and in each layer you can either skip it or not, you get two to the L different paths through the network, right? Two possibilities for every layer. <clears throat> and if you think about this, you can sort of unravel this into two to the power L parallel networks. So this shows this unraveled view over here. And so for example, one way to, for data to go through is to just skip everything completely. So that's one of the eight paths. And that is illustrated here. Another of the eight paths is, let's say, to skip the first two and go through the last one. So let's see, that one is illustrated here, and so on. So there's basically, in this picture, there's eight different paths that show you the eight different ways you can go through here. And from this perspective, you can think of the output as just these, a, a sum of these eight different paths. So it's sort of back to this ensemble idea where um, this is really an ensemble of many networks. And the thing is, when you start to look at the depths of these networks, yes, there's a few that have extreme depths. So like, like this, 
This one is essentially zero layer. That's one of the extremes. This is a three layer, that's the other extreme. But most of the layers are in between. And this is especially true when you have a cascade of many of them. So then it turns out like, for example, in a 110 layer network, most of the layers, most, most of the, sorry, most of these paths um, are of length like 10 to 34. The ones that are actually much deeper like this in these very deep networks, like 110 layers, there is sort of a uh, reduction of that, that gradient because um, even with like a ReLU because you're turning off the left half, as you go through you know, 110 layers, by the time you get to the beginning, there's really not much gradient left. So, so when you look at these resnets as ensembles of parallel networks, it's really like you have a bunch of, let's say medium size, medium depth networks like 10 to 34 all in parallel. And essentially you're just training them all in parallel. You're training them to work well together. So this is another way to think about these, um, that they're really ensembles of shallow networks. And there's a nice paper about this and it has a lot of experiments to, to you know, show convincing um, evidence of this. So for example, one of the things you can do with ResNets is you can drop out an entire layer without really causing much problem. Because when you chop out that layer, what you're really doing is you're chopping out half of these parallel networks, but you're still leaving the other half of them. And there's, there's tons of them, right? There's two to the power L. So if I have 110 layer network, I have two to the power 110. That's a lot. So, um, so I, you, you can drop out one or even two or several of these, and it doesn't have a huge effect. And this actually led to another idea. Maybe, maybe we should apply dropout on a layer basis instead of a node basis on a layer basis. So you're actually like randomly removing layers from your network during training and then putting them all back in during testing. And so this, this is called deep network with stochastic depth. But it's, you know, as you can see, it's very closely related to resonance. So, um, yeah, so this was, this was a huge advance. And uh, these, these resonates are great. Um, you can find pre-trained pre resonates of various depths. And, uh, and they're a great network if you, if you need to do something with your own research. Um, it's, it's a nice architecture. Any questions on resonance? All right. So, so that was a few, and and of course every year there's several new networks. Um, so around you know 2015 2016 there were a series of improvements of this Inception network version two, version three, version four. Eventually they combined inception with ResNet ideas. So they have an inception ResNet. And, you know, things got better. This inception version three took second place at ILS uh, VRC 2015. So ResNet took first place, this was second place. They still use this inception V3 quite a bit in generating uh, for its feature, feature generation um, and then they use those features for other things. So then there's the, the DenseNet. DenseNet, DenseNet is, is like a ResNet, except you add more skip connections. So what you do is every, every layer, you, you connect it back to all the previous layers. So it's like a ResNet only connects it back to the single previous. This one would connect it back to here as well. So... Um, so like here's, here's an example. So this one is connected back to the first, to the second, and the third. This one's connected back to the first, second, and so on. And so you'll, you'll do this, maybe not throughout the entire network, but maybe over a block of, in this case, um, 
you have four layers. And then here you have another block of four layers that are all connected like this. And in between, you can do a few other things like convolution and pooling. And, um, and this was shown to outperform ResNet by a little bit, although I think it has some memory issues. So I haven't really seen it used very much. Um, and there's, there's a few other ones that are also variations on ResNets. So after 2016, <clears throat> at least with the convolutional neural networks, people started uh, working more on making them more efficient than making the performance better, because the performance was getting almost perfect on um, ImageNet. So, but at the same time, these networks were, were very um, memory intensive and compute intensive, and so they said, well, what, what if I want to implement these things on a, you know, a cell phone? How do, I, how do I do that efficiently? So there's a number of uh, networks after that that were memory limited, um, compute limited, things like SqueezeNet, so SqueezeNet achieved AlexNet-like performance, but with 50 times fewer parameters. MobileNet, the next year, efficient in memory and computation and so on. So like I said, there's been um, you know, kind of various further iterations since then, um, as well as some completely different architectures. Nowadays, there's um, architectures that aren't convolutional, like transformers and things that, that are sort of taking over on top of convolutional networks. OK, so um, but these are all, all these ones we're mentioning here, these are all available in um, PyTorch. So if you want to play with any of them, you can do so. So let's see how we do that in PyTorch. So it's the Torch Vision package that has these pre-trained networks. So First, we import the torchvision.models package. And then let's say that I want to import VGG16. I'm going to tell it whether I want to import all the weights or not. So here, yeah, we're going to import the weights. So we're going to use pre-trained. And we'll store that as a model. OK, and then using print string model, we can print out what all these different layers do. We can see that the network is organized into basically like three sections. The first section, which is called the features section, has things like convolution, ReLU, max pool, over and over again. And there's 30 such layers. So here in PyTorch, when you when talk about layers, like convolution is one layer, ReLU is another layer, max pool is another layer, and so on. So there's 30 of those layers. And then the classifier section is basically linear, ReLU, dropout, repeated over and over again. But there's only about, you can see there's only three linear layers. <clears throat> okay. And so that, that part is, you know, basically like a, a shallow, dense network that's working on the features put out here. And then finally, this average pooling or adaptive average pooling layer, what this is used for it's used for ad uh, adapting to the image size. So originally, when this was trained, it was trained on ImageNet images, which are of size 224 by 224. Okay, but not all images are that size. So what do you do if you download a 100 by 100 image from Flickr, or you know, 100 by 200? What do you do? So <clears throat> if you think about the way convolution works, the, the, the size of the feature vector that, of, that comes out, because of convolution is just going to take whatever original image size you have and just you know, convolve it and so on. So the size of this feature vector is going to be directly proportional to the size of the image put in, of, of the image you put in. So what this average pool layer does is it adapts the size that comes out of here so that it is a fixed size so that the classifier can interpret it. And as you can see, it wants the final pixels to be 7 by 7. So if your image is larger, what it's going to do is it's going to average it over larger blocks to get down to 7 by 7. And if your image is 
smaller than 224 by 224, it's going to average it over smaller blocks, but finally the output will be, be 7 by 7. So that gives you um, some freedom in the size of the images you put in. This adaptive averaging, average pooling layer will, will adjust. Okay. Does that make sense, what it's doing? Yeah. I'm curious about the, uh, the performance if we resize the image and use the, without using the adaptive pooling, which is better? Well, there would be a big problem because, um, so you, you can see that the number of features in this linear layer is fixed, 25, 0, 88. So that's 7 by 7 by 512. So, so this is 7 by 7. And then 512 is the number of channels. And the number of channels is, is also fixed. So if I didn't have 7 by 7 here, I wouldn't have the right size, and there would be an error. When I try to go into that linear layer, it would be like, size doesn't match. If we resize the input image into 224 by 2. Oh, I see. I think that would probably work very well. It would, um, yeah, I, I think it would, it, would work, it would work well. It's just that it's, um, you could say it's, it's not maybe necessary to do that. Um, but this provides you a more direct approach that, where you don't have to resize the image. That would be more expensive. Okay, so, <clears throat> And let's see, let's take a look at this classifier layer. So um, you can see the dropout percentage is one half. That's what they're using there. Um, yeah, I think everything else is sort of similar to what we talked about before. You can see the kernel sizes are three by three. You can see, um, yeah. I think, I think we talked about everything. OK, so this is, uh, this is basically just taking a look at BGG16 and PyTorch. All right, any questions on, on this? So what about how do we get images? So, um, so one way to get images is through the Flickr photo sharing site. So there's a demo um, for how to do this. And then you'll also need to do this for the lab. So you need to. Um, essentially get, get an account at Flickr that will give you your own personal API key. And once you have that, you can query Flickr for images. And you just tell it the keyword you want, like elephants, and then it will give you many um, random pictures of elephants. So here's some examples of the pictures we're getting. As you can see, there, a lot of them are not very high resolution. Um, honestly, it's hard to even tell if there's elephants in a lot of them, right? I could see some tusks here, but I don't know that I would have known that that was an elephant, and so on. Anyway, um, this is one way we can get images, basically of any subject we want. So then how do we store them? Well, um, one way to store them that works well with PyTorch is you make two separate subdirectories, one test, one train. And then within each of those, you make separate class subdirectories. So for example, test elephants. And if we had more classes, we could do test cars or bicycles or whatever. OK, so once things are set up like that, that's compatible with PyTorch's um, you know, how it likes to see things. So we can use this image folder function creates this data set object. And <clears throat> at this point, we can use its um, preprocessing functions like normalization. So essentially, we want to make sure that, um, all right, so, so these color images, when, when people were working with ImageNet, they found that there were particular ways to normalize each of the red, green, and blue channels that work particularly well. So now these, these normalizations are relatively um, standard. I don't see it, let's see, I don't see it here. 
Okay. I, I don't think I included in these slides, but there's some kind of default normalizations on those channels that you want to use. You may want to resize things. Um, and actually, another, another point of this uh, adaptive average pool is that I believe you should be able to use different size images. Um, I don't know if, yeah, it's a question whether over the batch it allows different size images or maybe within each batch they need to be the same, but it, it can adapt. Okay, and then this is where we can also put in our data augmentation if we want it. So we can do shifts, crops, and things, things like that. And again, we don't need the images to be 224 by 224, although it's going to work best if they are because that's how um, ImageNet was trained, or this network was originally trained. Okay, so, so for example, we can set up a crop transform that um, focuses on the center 200 by 200 pixels of the image. And we can then um, compose that transform crop with transform two tensor. So, so again, we're going to be bringing in um, images in not in uh, not in tensor, you know, PyTorch tensor format. They're going to be coming in like NumPy format. So this is one of the things we need to do, and we can do this transformation to a tensor um, directly in this PyTorch routine here. Just make a list of transforms. And then in our image folder routine, this is where we tell it to look for the data, and we tell it here the list of transforms to use. So it's going to transform each of them to a tensor, and then it's going to crop it. And if we wanted to also change the size here, we could, we could do that here. OK. Um, then we declare the batch size to be 10. And now here's our data loader. We tell it where to get the data set. That's over here, what the batch size is. And once we have this loader, this is how we can pull samples from it, um, both the image and the class. All right. <clears throat> OK, so how do we classify a test image? Well, so the first thing we do is um, we put the model in evaluation mode. So basically, there's two modes. There's like a training mode and an eval mode. In the training mode, things like dropout are, um, are enabled, so it's dropping out nodes. But if you don't want to do that, you have to tell it specifically, go to evaluation mode. There's other things like batch norm. Um, batch norm behaves differently in the training versus the test modes. In training, batch norm is learning those scaling parameters. And then in test mode, they're fixed, and it's just applying them, the scaling and the shift parameters. So that's why you want to put your model in evaluation mode, because we're not training it now. We're just applying it, the pre-trained network, to our elephant images. OK? And then <clears throat> this with torch no grad says, do the following things without doing backpropagation, because again, we're not training it. So we're going to put um, the image through our model to get the output. The, the output, if you remember, is coming out from a linear layer, so it's just real numbers. So if, if what we want to do is look at um, probabilities, sorry, if we want to look at probabilities, we have to put it through a softmax layer. So we put it through the regular model, and then we take that output, and we put it through a softmax layer. And now these outputs are all numbers between 0 and 1. And they sum to 1. So it's basically like a PMF. So when I look at these numbers here, they tell me directly the probability that this model believes that it's in class 1, what's the probability it's in class 2, and so on. And OK, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to take, we're going to find the top three best guesses. In this output top k, you just tell it how many you want. OK, top three. And it's going to return for you 
the percentage, the confidence percentage for the top three, as well as the indices of the top three. So we can basically convert them to NumPy, and then we print them in this pandas data frame, and let's see what happens. So these are the 10 images in our batch, and this is um, the best guess, the second best guess, and the third best guess. So here's these probabilities. You can see 0 0.72, 0 0.2, 0 0.07. Okay, so with 72%, it believed that was in this class. With 20.6, 27, 0.7%, this one, and 7%, this one. And then we're also printing out just not just the number of the ImageNet class, but actually the name. So these are ImageNet classes, Indian elephant, African elephant, Tusker. So as you can see, it really is working. It's, um, it's interpreting these correctly because at least as long as Flickr didn't mess up in its labeling, you know, we, we do have elephant images. And you can see as you look across the other things in the class, we have essentially elephants. Okay, here we have a water buffalo, but it's doing pretty well. There's a leatherback turtle, Komodo dragon. Um, so in that case, you know, it wasn't sure, but, but also look at the probabilities, 30%, 27%, 9%. So you can see it wasn't really sure what was there. And some of them, if you remember, were actually pretty difficult to classify. I don't know, there's only eight images here, so maybe we're not seeing what, what it looks like, but you know, like this image, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it, it, I guess it's an elephant, maybe it's, yeah, but you can imagine why the network would, would not classify that correctly. Okay, so overall, we can see it's doing a really great job. Okay, any questions about anything here? All right. What if I wanted to look at the feature maps within the network? How do we do that? So we can build our own little, we'll call it a feature extractor. And essentially what it will do is when we put uh, data through the network, it will pull out the features inside the network and, and store them and report them as, as the output of this function. Okay, so, um, so we're gonna give it the model. We're gonna give it a uh, a list of feature layers and a list of classifier layers that, let me see. Um, these are the ones, these are the, the feature layers that we want it to extract data from and these are the classifier layers we want it to extract data from. And remember, we have these different groupings. These are like all feature layers. These are classifier layers. Okay, so this is what our function is gonna do. It's going to initialize some structures as empty, and it's going to have a for loop where we go through um, the model's feature layers. So you can see self.model.features versus dot classifier, and then look at the modules in that feature section and look at the items in there. And so this is, we're gonna loop, basically, we're gonna go, we're gonna go through here, one by one, down through all of these guys. And we're gonna put X, the input, through that module, through, put it through one layer of the network, and then we're gonna check if the name of the module we're in matches one of the feature layers we have specified, then let's take this X and let's add it to this empty array. And then we're gonna go through again and again, one by one, put the data through, check to see if we wanna save it, and save it if it's needed. Okay, so then we have to do the average pooling. So we're gonna do that manually. We also have to do, this is our flattening layer where we're taking this um, four-way tensor and converting it to a two-way tensor. And then we're gonna do something similar again for the classifier modules. So we're gonna loop through the classifier modules one by one, put the data through them, and if our 
if the name of our classifier layer matches one of the ones we specified, then store the output. And so finally, we'll return the output of the network as well as the feature and classifier outputs that we, we extracted. And now we can plot them. <clears throat> so this is just an example. So the original image channels, red, green, and blue, look like this. When we go through the very first layer of our network, um, these are four of the channels. There's many more than four, but you know, just an example. And when you look at these, you can still see the elephant in them. Basically, that first layer, if you remember when we, um, we saw exam examples for AlexNet, this is VGG, so these are smaller kernels, but basically it's doing things like edge detection, right? This is a, detecting a lot of vertical edges, this one too. Maybe it's doing a little blurring or who knows what, but you can see that it's, it's doing these really kind of basic transformations of this, these elephant images. But by the time you get to layer 10, okay, number one, what's happened is the feature maps have gotten much smaller in the pixel domain. So now we have, I don't know, this looks like 16 by 16, and there's gonna be a lot more channels. Um, but when you look at what's in these feature maps, they don't look anything like our image anymore, right? We're, as we go through the network, we're moving gradually from the image domain to the class domain. So it's getting less and less image-like, and by layer 10, it doesn't look very image-like. It still does have pixel versus pixel dimensions, but it's on its way to becoming purely about class and um, you know, eventually going to be flattened and then put through those dense layers. So it's just an example of what these feature maps look like and how to extract them. All right. Any questions on any of this? So you can, you can find all this in some of the demos. All right, so, um, so that kind of concludes what I wanted to say about classification, image classification. So let's expand the scope a little bit and talk about other things we can do in imaging problems. So more generally. So here are a few things you may have heard of. Things like object detection, image segmentation, and so on. Let's look at these pictures to understand a little bit about this. Okay, so what we focused on is classification. So you're given an image, and there's one and only one label that characterizes the entire image. So for example, it's cat. And your objective is, given this image, you want to, you want to find the correct label out of a list of such labels. That's, that's classification. Um, <clears throat> another one is segmentation. There's actually sort of different kinds of segmentation. So this is what they call semantic segmentation. So here the, the objective is for every pixel in the image, you want to classify that pixel. And um, it's almost more of a, a clustering problem, which we'll talk about later. But essentially, in this image, there ends up being four different kinds of pixels. Grass pixels, cat, tree, or sky. And then you want to determine whether every pixel is grass, cat, tree, or sky. So it's a very different application, right, than, than imaging. So in this case, you're putting out one single number at the end of your network. Here, you're putting out a different number for every pixel in your network. So this actually requires a very different network architecture. And probably the most famous and common one for this is called a UNet. It's a network where it you know, takes in a full-size image, puts out a full-size image. But what it does in the middle is it kind of um, makes that image smaller and smaller and smaller to kind of get to the heart of, of the structure, and then it expands again. So it looks kind of like a U. And there's also these skip connections that go across, um, kind of like a ResNet. <clears throat> so 
Yeah, so if, if you want to learn more about segmentation, you can, you can click on this link. Okay, so here's another, another thing you could try to do. You could do classification and localization. So not only do you want to say there's a cat here, but you want to roughly say where is that cat in the image. And we actually saw an example of this, I think, way back at the beginning of this unit. This was part of even the early um, those ILS VRC competitions they had classification with localization. So you want to give a bounding box on where you think that object is. But there's just a single object here. Okay. So a variation on that is object detection, where it's like this, but for multiple objects. So like here, in this picture, you know, there's a dog here, another dog here, another cat here. And you know, perhaps, I don't know why they didn't include tree. You could say there's a tree there, maybe a pillow here, and so on. So that's object detection. Um, <clears throat> for this, you can use networks that are similar to our classification networks, but you use a very different loss function. Um, and yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting how they, how they do this in practice. And then there's kind of another one that's like a combination of segmentation and object detection, which is called instance segmentation. So here you want to, um, when you classify your pixels, it's not that you want to classify every pixel in the image like in this semantic segmentation, it's like you want to do object detection, but instead of giving a bounding box on that object, you want to give all the pixels that correspond to that object. So these are the pixels that it believes that there's a dog here. These are the pixels for this dog. These are the pixels for this cat. And then all the background you can see is not categorized. So. In these cases, you have multiple objects. Okay. So there's a huge world of different image classification type problems you can formulate. <clears throat> and then there's many other things you can do with images. So for example, image compression, things like JPEG that have been around for decades. You could ask the question, well, maybe with a neural network, I can learn a better compression algorithm than JPEG? And the answer is yes, you can. Um, and so there's a whole sub-community of people that work on that. Then there's all these different um, image processing sort of things you can do with deep networks. Like if somebody gives you a noisy image, can you reduce the noise in that image and you know just retain the image itself? So that would be image denoising. Um, <clears throat> Deblocking is where, I'm sure you've all seen this, if, if you're watching um, like a video that was coded with like image compression and then the bit rate goes down, maybe there's some interference and you start to get these weird blocks in the image. Well, even when things are working, if you look really closely and the image compression is significant, you can see that there's some weird blocking artifacts so maybe the question is, can I design a deep, deep network that gets rid of those? Um, maybe if you put this in your TV, it will do a better job uh, when, when the signal strength is not good. Another application is deblurring. So if somebody gives you a blurry image, can you sharpen it? And then there's a number of related image recovery things you can do. So um, if I give you a small image, can you resize it to a big one? If you did that just with a standard interpolation technique, it would look blurry. But, so can you sharpen it so that it looks like I took a big, a big uh, photo in the first place? That's called super resolution. Then there's some more specialized uh, things that occur. So <clears throat> there are some applications like, um, let's see. If you, want to, um, if you want to go to some sort of extreme imaging scenarios, 
Sometimes you can build sensors that respond to magnitude but not phase. Um, and sometimes those sensors are working in the Fourier domain. And so one example is, um, I'm not an expert on optics, but, but a lens kind of does like a Fourier transform. And so if you want to do lensless imaging, so if you want to build a microscope, one of the big problems is that the lens, the thickness of the lens, limits how close you can get to the sample. And so for that reason, people have been developing lensless microscopes, where the processing that is typically done by the lens is actually done computationally. And when you do that processing, you end up having to tackle this phase retrieval problem. So essentially what you get is you get the Fourier transform, the spatial Fourier transform of the image, but you only get to see the magnitude, not the phase. So the question is, can I somehow numerically reconstruct the phase knowing something about the image, knowing that it is a natural image and so on. So that's the phase retrieval problem. If you're doing magnetic resonance imaging, then you also measure things in the, in the frequency domain. But to speed up that exam, you collect samples, you collect many fewer samples than the Nyquist sampling theorem tells you that you should collect. So now you have to somehow fill in the missing samples you can do this with deep networks. Computed tomography is sort of similar, except there, instead of the Fourier transform, using something called the radon transform. So there's all these interesting applications in image recovery that are nowadays tackled deep networks because these deep networks perform way better than any of the methods that were developed in the past. OK, so that's, there's tons of stuff you can do with uh, deep networks for imaging. And of course, there's many, many other applications that are not imaging that um, for some of, these, some of these things still make sense. Like maybe I have a, um, an EKG signal or an ECG signal and I want to denoise it. So you can still do that. It would be one dimensional convolutions instead of two and so on. And so as I mentioned, um, the networks for these problems, they might look similar to the ones we've seen, or they might look very different. So I've mentioned UNETs. Um, Autoencoders are networks that uh, they're sort of like a bottleneck. They try to take in an image and distill it down to a few essential components. And from those a few components, they build it back up. And um, <clears throat> there's many reasons that you might want to build something like that. Recurrent neural networks, they, they essentially they process data, and then the output comes back to the input. If you've studied digital filtering, it's like um, a recursive digital filter, except rather than a linear filter, you have a whole uh, network. Usually not a very deep network. It gets deep because of the recursion. So those are RNNs. And then there's various modifications of those RNNs that are better, something called long, short time. Um, what does the M stand for? Memory. memory. Yeah, long, short term memory networks. And those, um, those are basically improvements of these RNNs that the RNNs have the problem that they sort of forget. So these, these guys try to prevent that forgetting. And then the thing that's uh, probably hottest in the last couple of years are these so-called transformers. So these are networks that st started um, to gain a lot of popularity in um, <clears throat> natural language processing. So let's say I want to translate a sentence from one language to another. So how do I do that? So um, the first thing you could do is you could code that sentence into a sequence of numbers. And if you know the language you're working with, there's a nice way to code that language. You can do that for the two languages. Now you have these two sequences of numbers. How do you do that translation? So if you think about it, it's not like the first word in the first language corresponds to the first word in the second language, right? Because of the grammar, things can get mixed around quite a bit. Maybe what's at the end of the sentence in the first language is at the front of the sentence in the second language. So it's sort of a complicated problem. It, a convolutional network doesn't really have the right ar architecture for that because a convolutional network, yeah, 
So um, these transformers were developed um, to solve that problem. They were they're basically state of the art. And then once they saw that this was working so well for images, they said, "Well, wait a minute." Or sorry for for um, for natural language processing. They said, "Well, maybe we can use these in other applications like imaging." So um, so now so now yes, these these things are um, very powerful. But one of the challenges they require, most incarnations require extremely large data sets and large computation to train. So it's something that like Google can do, but we can't do it uh, at a university, let's say. It's just, it's just too much computation. There are some kind of um, transfer learning techniques you can use, but, you know, and so on. So, so there's uh, tons of work going on in, in this field, all these fields. Um, it's, it's very exciting and very evolving. Uh, every month there's something new. All right. So I think that's all I had for this unit. Any other questions? Yeah, yeah I just have one question. So for that example, um, when you have a, a, the single object classifier, classification mm -hmm. model, so if you train it with, like, for example, with like grass and cat, what's to stop it from classifying that as grass versus cat? Because there's like more grass in that image. Right? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think, um, I mean, that that would be, it wouldn't work well if you did that, because you're right. It's gonna it's gonna be very conflicted as to classifying this single image as cat or grass. It's probably gonna have high scores for both, and maybe it might be kind of random, like as to which one is higher than the other. So I think for that reason, if you looked at ImageNet, you would find, or yeah, the ImageNet database and the classes, you would find that grass is not one of. The, <laughs> you know, it's it's like it's more like objects. These these are the sort of things we want to look for, uh, not grass, <clears throat> yeah. But if you, if you can do something like object detection, now you could add the grass class, and now it could do, you know, jointly classifying grass and, and cats. Um, that's not, I, I, I don't really think that's the way this is handled. I think, I think people would think of grass as a type of background and not like an object where you want to put a bounding box on it. So, um, so this kind of stuff is very important for um, autonomous vehicles because they want to look at a scene and they want to say, here are cars, here are pedestrians, here are bicycles and stuff. Here's a road, here's sky. So it's like a combination of segmentation and object detection, right? Um, but, but like the road wouldn't be an object. That would be kind of one type of background. Autoencoders, yeah. So, um, so autoencoders are really the application or the, the machine learning task is typically a bit different than what we have talked about. So we have focused until now in the course on regression and classification. There's other tasks that are very different than these. As we go forward, we'll talk about some other ones. We'll talk about clustering quite a bit. Um, but another one is. Um, and, and that's a, a, an example of what they call unsupervised learning, where you don't have any labels. And so autoencoders are also used for unsupervised tasks, where the objective might be, can you build me something that generates many examples of, you know, let's say human faces? So if that's my goal, you can see that the, the, the goal is very different than classification or regression. Yes, exactly. So, so, so it, you could use this for data augmentation. You could say, I can't collect enough samples of real human faces, so let me just generate them, and then I can generate as many as I want. That would be one application of this so-called like generative. That, that's um, yeah. So, so that would be an unsupervised task. That's um, they call them generative models. That basically you want to generate samples from a distribution. So here the distribution is like faces. And so the way that these, and, and there's different ways to do that, but autoencoders are one way of doing it where you, um, 
you have what's called an encoder network and a decoder network. So each of these has various layers. And the layers might look similar, like convolution, ReLU, convolution, ReLU. But the dimension changes from something that's the size of the image all the way to a very low dimension, maybe like 100, 100 samples, 100 numbers. So here again, like 224 by 224, take it down to 100. And then the decoder network takes 100 numbers and maps it back to 224 by 224. And hopefully this looks like a face. <clears throat> so in building such a network, you're basically saying, how can I describe every face by 100 numbers? And then how can I take 100 numbers, maybe I generate them randomly, and generate a face? So that's sort of, you're, you're kind of training a network that does these two things together. It maps from images to what they call codes, and it maps from codes back to images. Once you've trained this network, if all you care about is generation, then what you do is you just keep the second half, and then you put in random codes here, and out will come random realizations, or realizations of, of faces. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think, I mean, people have done studies on these different methods and they've tried to uh, look at uh, whether there are any examples of your training data that are actually present in your generated outputs. Um, like if I, if I put in random numbers here, did this decoding network just memorize some of these or is it truly generating new samples? So that, that is stuff that people have written papers about. Yeah. There's other ways to do this. Um, there are things called um, GANs, generalized, or uh, so they're uh, generative adversarial networks. So they also take in a very small uh, random input, and then they generate, let's say, an image output. What's different about them is that you have another network. So this is your generator network. And then you have another network, which is um, essentially a network that tries to tell if the generator is doing a good job or not. It's called a discriminator network. And the, you train these networks to fight against each other. So the first one tries to generate good images, good enough to fool the discriminator. The discriminator basically puts out a real or fake. So it's just a binary classifier. So this guy, given an ima input image, it, it classifies it as real or fake. So this generator tries to generate images that fool this discriminator. And then the discriminator tries to you know, learn uh, what the generator is up to to try to outperform the generator. And so the two of them get better and better and better as you train them. And if everything works out, the generator is able to put out you know, really realistic images. So this kind of adversarial stuff, this, this way of, of uh, training, you can actually, you can add this to many of these other tasks. If I want to do image denoising, I can actually add I could use, let's say, L2 or L1 loss, or I could actually add an adversarial loss where I have this whole other network that I've trained, and in addition to minimizing L2 plus L1, I'm gonna to try to fool this network that knows whether the, the denoised image is, is real or fake. So, um, so this, this is kind of a powerful concept, this adversarial um, training. It's, it's, it's more than these, uh, it's used in more than these generative adversarial networks. Okay, any other questions? All right, yeah, so there's, there's a, tons of fun stuff out there. We can only touch, you can see, only touch 
on a very simple problem in this course. And so there's uh, a lot of other things. We're hoping to get another kind of follow-on to this course going, but um, it's, yeah, it's, it's hard. We don't have as many faculties we'd like to teach all this stuff. So maybe, maybe one of these days we'll put something together. Anyway, that's it for, for this unit. So on Wednesday, I'll do the review of units five through eight. And then next week, I'll start in on the ensemble learning. We'll learn about trees and random forests and XG boosts and all that stuff um, next week. All right. Have a good one.